Assalamu alaikum. My name is Yvonne Ridley. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because um, I am the journalist who was captured by the Taliban back in 2001. It was a horrifying, life-changing experience, but it set me on a path to Islam. And alhamdulillah, uh, two years later, I ended up embracing this great faith. And, uh, and, and here we are um, in these incredibly difficult times. And I want to talk to you um, a little bit about that, but to put into context that these times, while they are difficult for us, um, it is nothing to what our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, went through. And I, uh, I, I wrote a book on him um, a couple of years ago, and I'll be referring to this uh, to this book when I uh, when I talk to you about this. Sorry, it's very strange. I'm used to engaging with an audience, and here I am stuck thousands of miles away, um, probably like you, in lockdown, in isolation. So, I want to open with the simple declaration of faith which defines us all um, as Muslims, the Shahada. And I bear witness there is none worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and messenger. And I would like to thank the Islamic Forum um, for Australian Muslims for inviting me and, and look forward to working with them in the future on um, other events. Now then it's been, uh, I did say my name was Yvonne Ridley, didn't I? Sorry if um, if I forgot to introduce my myself, but salam alaikum. So it's been four months now since uh, the COVID-19 was detected in Wuhan, uh, China. And in that time, our whole planet has changed along with our way of life. Normal is no longer a word we use in our vocabulary. Instead, phrases like social distancing, self-isolation and lockdown have become universal. Meetings in Zoom via Skype and this one on StreamYard or the new norm as COVID-19 uh, pandemic rips through our communities without mercy from the northern to the southern hemispheres. It's hard to see a light at the end of this dark tunnel, which is lined with fear, heartbreak and misery for many of us. As a journalist, one of my greatest concerns, along with the spread of the virus, is the spread of mis misinformation, fake news and hoax stories, which are emerging on the social networks. These lies and distortions, news of false cures and miracle medicines serve no purpose at all, other than to fuel more conspiracy theories and spread fear through uncertainty. But you know, none of this is new. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, lived through all of this sort of nonsense and much, much more. But instead of whipping up the fear, he introduced a calm and uh, through his common sense and wisdom. His sage advice nearly 1400 years ago, like Islam, is as relevant today as it was back then for the many followers of the, what was then a new religion. And I want to go back to the 7th century to show just how relevant Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is in the 21st century. He is a man of all seasons, someone whose wisdom will never age and date. For a start, he would tell us all to stop the spread of false news, fake videos and stories which have infected our social networks. 
Many of you will already be aware of the verse in the Holy Quran, O oh, you who believe, if an evil person comes to you with any news, verify it, lest you should harm people in ignorance, and afterwards you become regretful for all what you have done. And that was in Al-Hujrat 49, Ayat 6. In this uncertain world, there is only one certainty, and that is we're all in it together, regardless of our personal beliefs, nationality, skin color, gender, or culture. COVID-19 moves without mercy, targeting people of all backgrounds and all faiths, from princes to paupers, prime ministers, pensioners, health workers, and celebrities. We are all targets for the virus, as well as the spread of false news. We can only deal in facts, and what we do know is that this virus is changing our way of life, possibly forever. We're told there's no silver bullet, and until a vaccine is found, we may have to continue to live our lives in isolation. We know the closure of mosques, synagogues, churches, temples, and other places of worship around the world have caused real consternation. But we need to balance our faith with logic and reason in these troubled times. And this is what I want to talk to you about today, about our beloved prophet, peace be upon him. Because while it might be difficult to tell fact from fake news, I know you will pay attention to his advice. Pandemics are rare, but they are not new. Outbreaks of plague and diseases have been inflicted on the human race throughout history. And back in the seventh century, um, the Arabian world, Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, issued sound advice when faced with the equivalent of a pandemic. He said, if you hear of an outbreak of plague in a land do not enter it. But if the plague breaks out in a place while you are in it, do not leave that place. He also said, those with contagious diseases should be kept away from those that are healthy. In other words, he was advocating self-isolation back in the 7th century. While those of us who believe in God also put our trust in God, it is worth recalling another Hadith or story involving our beloved prophet, peace be upon him. He noticed a Bedouin man leaving his camel without tying it and asked, why don't you tie down your camel? The Bedouin answered, I put my trust in God. And the prophet responded, tie your camel first, then put your trust in God. In other words, it is wise to take precautions. And in the case of COVID-19, that means self-isolating and keeping a safe distance. As in Europe, the stories are the same for you in Australia and New Zealand. Our capital cities have fallen silent. Hotels, restaurants and our cafe societies have closed. Schools and community centres are locked and entire families are self-isolating behind doors. Curfews and lockdowns, once alien to our lifestyles, have now become the norm. I think a few of you listening to me today will have not experienced anything like it. So while we are in uncharted territory, we don't need to panic. But what we should do is ask the question, what would Muhammad do? and then seek his leadership skills and advice and wisdom. I fully began to realize the significance and import, importance of the prophet and his relevance in the 21st century when I began to research life, uh, his life for a, a book that I wrote called The Rise of the Prophet Muhammad, Don't Shoot the Messenger, um, because of... Uh, the publication of uh, crude cartoons and the furore that was created um, at that period in time, just a few years ago, everyone suddenly became aware of a man called Muhammad who introduced Islam to the world. Personally, 
The more I read about his history, the more fascinated I became. He was a man so perfect in nature, good character and deeds, a man who revered women for their strengths and their weaknesses, and who viewed us not as weird creatures from another planet, but as equals in spirituality, worth and education. And on top of all of that, he had a sense of humour, going on about his business, usually with a smile on his face. I know it's difficult to go about and smile today in the shadow of COVID-19, but maybe we should try it. Being a journalist, I was mindful of the need to be impartial, and so I questioned the validity of everything I read about him. It was obvious Muslims adored him, with some putting him on a pedestal, which elevated him almost beyond the status of an ordinary human being. It's often said you can discover a great deal about a person by the friends he keeps, but I also believe that if you really want to know someone, then listen to what their enemies have to say as well. And so for the purposes of uh, the book, which I've got um, here, I keep referring to it, for the purposes of the book, I decided to seek out his detractors and critics in the West and the views of other faiths and none who've chosen to write their own accounts and analysis of his life. Some of their comments were toxic while others were snide and sneering. But what I did discover is that all, without exception, were in awe of the breathtaking achievements of one man who emerged from the obscurity of the Arabian desert lands to become the most recognized human being in the world today. No other spiritual leader or religion draws as much controversy as the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Islam, but this should perhaps be seen in the context of the rapid expansion of our faith. No other religion in history developed as quickly and became as widespread as Islam, and today, in the 21st century, it's still the fastest growing religion in the world. From a population base of 200 million in 1900, Islam has more than uh, gone fivefold, uh, much more. In 2020, there are now 1.9 billion Muslims in the world today. And I don't want to justify um, some of the, the well, it will explain, although uh, not justify, some of the alarming criticism directed at Islam and our beloved uh, Prophet Muhammad. However, the attacks that we experience today, which hurt us today, are nothing new. And the rapidity of the Muslim expansion in the 7th century is a unique phenomenon in religious history. Within the space, I mean, consider this, within the space of a hundred years, the Islamic land stretched from the Atlantic coast of Africa to the banks of the River Indus in present-day Pakistan. The Muslims found themselves in lands with already sophisticated culture and developed religious systems. Being in part a missionary endeavor, they confronted indigenous people from an Islamic perspective as well as military level, so that the expansion was also ideological and proselytizing. Islam's first contact with Christianity was almost immediate when you consider that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, his message was delivered in the homelands of Christianity, principally Egypt, Palestine, Mesopotamia and Syria. That gave rise to a sustained attempt to malign Islam in order to create a barrier which would prevent conversions to Islam. And it seems early critics thought that by attacking the messenger of Islam, that would be the most effective way of destroying this new faith. They couldn't have been more wrong. A 20th century Scottish academic and scholar William Montgomery Watt 
who was also an Anglican priest, wrote, without a remarkable combination of qualities in Muhammad, it is improbable that the expansion would have taken place and the military potential of the Arabs might easily have spent itself in raids on Syria and Iraq with no lasting consequences. He identified three qualities of character that led to the founding development and the amazing growth of Islam. First, he identified Muhammad's gift as a seer through the revelations made to him. The Arab world was given a framework of ideas to develop the, these ideas. The provision of such a framework involved both insight into the fundamental causes of the, the social malaise of the time and his genius to articulate and emotionally move those who heard him. Secondly, there is Muhammad's wisdom as a statesman. Throughout um, the framework of the Quran, he unveiled concrete policies and institutions. Much has been written about how far-sighted he was, his political strategy and his social reforms, of which I'll talk about shortly. His wisdom in these matters is shown by the rapid expansion of his small state to a world empire after his death and by the adaptation of social institutions to many different environments, uh, their continuance for nearly 14 centuries. Thirdly, there is his skill and tact as an administrator and his wisdom in the choice of those whom he delegated and put into administrative place. Sound institutions and sound policy will not go far if the execution of affairs is faulty and fumbling. When he died, the state he had founded was a going concern, able to withstand the shock of his removal. And once it had recovered from this shock, it went on to expand at a prodigious speed. The more I reflected on the history of Muhammad and of early Islam, the more I was amazed to, amazed to see the vastness of his achievement. With the zeal of their new religion and spurred on by the acquisition of new lands and wealth for an expanding population, the early Muslims managed to overrun the Byzantine provinces of Syria and Egypt and the Sassanid heartlands of Iran, the rapid succession of events which led to the Fertile Crescent, and Egypt being subjugated by Muslims caused a profound sense of shock and awe to Christians who found their traditional heartlands falling under the control of Islam. As a result, there were genuine fears for the very survival of Christianity, as well as the economic cost of the loss of the wealthy provinces of Syria and Egypt. The Christian response to Islam then, as it is now, was to try and expose the Prophet Muhammad as a heretic or try to undermine his work and his character. They obviously felt if they could destroy the reputation of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then they could destroy Islam. The monks and the clergy who framed the intellectual response in those early days set about to defend Christianity in the field of ideas, just as their military counterparts developed a strategy on the battlefield. Although military battles were lost, the intellectual struggle and the battle for hearts and minds continued even more aggressively. And really, it still does today. Every word spoken or attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was scrutinized. His radical new creed shook the very foundations of Christian doctrine by openly challenging the very heart of established Christian beliefs. Beliefs such as the concepts of the Holy Trinity, crucifixion, and the divinity of Jesus Christ were openly challenged and disparaged. It is obvious that nothing would pacify or satisfy some of the most virulent critics of the day. Sadly, that same Islamophobic tendency can be seen in evidence in the 21st century. 
Although the attacks on our beloved prophet are largely based on his personal life rather than his religious significance in the Quran. In truth, this hostility was not reciprocated by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who promoted the idea that people of the book, i.e. Christians and Jews, should be protected by Muslims and be allowed to carry on their worship unhindered. And it's important to remember that. He relied on interfaith dialogue and agreements with non-Muslims. And we saw this when he negotiated with the Christian king of Abyssinia to give safe passage to some of the first generation of Muslims whose lives were being threatened by the people of the Quraysh tribe at the time. We might feel under fire today because of the increase of Islamophobia, the stresses of living through a 21st century pandemic. And of course, I know that Australia is recovering from unprecedented fires from last year. There are times when we seem to be under attack from all quarters and sometimes from within our own ranks. But every time we are challenged and tested, we simply need to ask ourselves, what would Muhammad do? Think WWMD. Who remembers the emergence of Daesh in 2014, this new group of Muslims who burst onto the scene in the Middle East, seizing huge swathes of Syrian and Iraqi lands while grabbing sensational headlines around the world? The Islamic State was led by an Iraqi called Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and by June of that year, he declared the establishment of a caliphate. More headlines followed and waves of alarm swept the globe as the barbarity and terror spread by Daesh knew no bounds. However, their arrival had been foretold already. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, warned that a rogue group of Muslims would emerge after his death and detailed a number of characteristics that would identify them. Most significantly, he said, they would worship so intently that other practicing Muslims would feel their own efforts were small by comparison. However, he said their actions would be insincere and outward piety would be cosmetic, explaining there will be differences and splits in my ummah. My ummah will split and a group will come out who are good in their speech, but terrible in their actions. Their speech is flowery, their speech is attractive, but their actions belie their very words. They shall recite the Quran, but it will not leave their throats. They call to the book of Allah, but they have nothing to do with it. He said they would speak loudly about Islam, but then their actions would be at odds with the content of the Quran. They are speaking the best speech that you will ever hear of any man, but they will leave Islam like an arrow leaves its prey. Just as he warned, and less than 20 years after his death, a radical new group emerged in 656, and they were the first sect to break away from mainstream Islam and exhibit extremist tendencies long before the much-publicized Sunni-Shia split. These uh, extremists made their mark, causing terror and civil war, but their influence rapidly diminished along with their extreme ideology. But other rogue groups would come along and punctuate Islamic history in similarly horrific ways. And as I say, you know, we've had Daesh, as the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had predicted, the new sects and groups would have little impact on the foundation or theology. Yet he would declare uh, these people disbelievers and and um, and he was right. Eventually, the movement um, of these extremists fell victim and died out through the legacy of their own uh, concept of, about sinners. And and uh, but they will come back again. At the height of its no notoriety, Daesh seemed to be producing the horrific pornographic violent videos of, of beheadings. The truth is the bloodshed and depth of depravity um, 
was nothing new, as this latest group is following in the footsteps of countless other extremists, as foretold by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The raping and enslavement of the Yazidi women was wholly against Islamic law, and had Daesh been well versed in Islam, they would have known this. Um, there are numerous hadiths available to reinforce this. Islam has zero tolerance um, approaches to rape and the crime of rape is ex explicitly prohibited in the religion. The widespread opinion among both Sunni and Shia jurists that Muslim fighters are permitted to have sexual intercourse with slaves acquired through war directly contradicts the very precise textual evidence in both the Quran and Hadith. While Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi appeared to launch his Islamic State at an alarmingly rapid pace, think about how long it took Muhammad to roll out uh, his caliphate. 23 years it took for the whole message to be delivered from the Creator. The new 21st century um, caliphate ruled with an iron fist and operated a regime of fear. But the core message from Muhammad was one of love and compassion while creating a collective social paradigm shift toward common good that would be sustained long after his death. During the last few years of his mission, he was able to establish law and order in a society where all citizens were equal in rights and responsibility. And he left behind a written constitution as a matter of record and reference. Most Muslims could see there were glaring inequalities in the Daesh regime, which jarred sharply with much of Muhammad's teachings, including his farewell message, where he made it abundantly clear everyone was equal. The big surprise to the Muslim world's analysis and Islamic scholars of knowledge is that people were surprised by the emergence, brutality and audacious enterprise of the religious zealots that formed Daesh. Had they researched the Prophet Muhammad's teachings, they would have found his warnings about the emergence of extremists and rogue elements that would periodically appear on the scene and challenge the beliefs of ordinary Muslims. When he first prophesied the arrival and ideology of extreme groups, he could well have been describing al-Baghdadi and his followers, as he said here, at the end of time, meaning the last days of the world, there will appear some people among you who are young in age, immature and senseless, they will use the best of the speech of the people in their claims and they will leave Islam just as the arrow pierces the body of the game and then abandons it. Their faith will not go past their throats. So wherever you see them, dispense of them for their killing will be recompensed and rewarded on the day of judgment. Some of the more lurid stories that arose from the Daesh Caliphate was about slavery. Another stick our critics used wrongly to attack Muslims. Slavery was not created by Islam. And there is an abundance of Islamic tests and hadith which make it quite clear that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, barely tolerated slavery and even called for its abolition. In fact, Islam did more than any other religion and any other political system to free slaves. It's worth remembering that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was making his own observations and comments against slavery, urging those around him to free their slaves. Nearly 1,200 years ahead of the Western abolitionists led by the English uh, politician William Wilberforce, by the 7th century, slavery was already flourishing across the region, with trade being firmly established and controlled by the Greeks and the Romans, Byzantines and, and others. There is only one Quranic verse which authorizes the capture of prisoners of war, and it does not permit slavery, ordering military commanders to either free the prisoners of wars or hold them 
to ransom. Enslaving a captive is therefore arguably illegal. And certainly enslaving a non-combatant is likewise an Islamic crime. There is also another verse in the Quran 364 that could arguably promote its abolition since it expressly condemns any person of the book who seeks lordship over another human being. Of course, in the 21st century, there can be no Sharia circumstances where slavery can return, but this does not stop the issue of Islam and slavery being the subject of much debate and deliberate misunderstanding by some followers of the faith, including Daesh. In September 2014, 122 Muslim scholars from around the world came together and signed an open letter to the self-styled Caliph Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, informing him of the group's violations of Islam. Of course, he ignored the 17-page document, which listed 24 acts committed by Daesh in violation of Islam, including a reference to slavery. The scholars stated the reintroduction of slavery is forbidden in Islam. It was abolished also by universal consensus. The Quran, while recognizing the iniquity of slavery, stopped short of calling for its total abolition, although sought to bring the trade to an end. Therefore, it's not surprising the new Islamic faith found immediate resistance among the privileged and the elite, while many of its initial converts were drawn from among the slaves living in Mecca. Abu Bakr, arguably the prophet's right-hand man and a wealthy companion, also promoted the idea of ending slavery. And to lead by example, he used much of his wealth to buy the freedom of newly converted Muslim slaves from their non-Muslim masters. I think his most famous purchase um, from the Meccan elite was Bilal, the Ethiopian slave and the first African to convert to Islam. Um, no wonder uh, Bilal was so devoted to Islam and surprisingly he became one of the most faithful followers and promoters because of his, um, also because of his exceptional voice, he was chosen to become the first caller to prayers in the new Islamic religion. So while the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, tried to persuade his followers to manumit or free the slaves, the practice was never fully abolished, but his abolitionist leanings were viewed as yet another threat to the Meccan establishment, who could not conceive of life without their slaves. Imagine it at the time, how controversial this would be. But introducing Islam and its conscience-pricking social reforms was a gradual process. It took 23 years before the entire word of God was revealed to the prophet, and partly because he must have realized that introducing an immediate ban like forbidding alcohol, promiscuous behavior, and slavery would have been repellent to some would-be converts and, and was widely resisted by others. So everything was gradual. Nevertheless, the outlawing of slavery was promoted in God's name by Muhammad, peace be upon him, who clearly wanted to see an end to the practice which would eventually be banned under international law some 1300 years later. By the time he died, he had freed all of his uh, slaves. And he said, whoever frees a slave, Allah will save all the parts of his body from the hellfire as he has freed the body parts of the slave. Even by adopting a Eurocentric approach, it was obvious slavery in Islam was quite different in terms of slavery to the West as well. Slaves who were shipped from Africa uh, by the West could rarely get their freedom. Those enslaved by force would die in slavery. Whereas in Islam, servitude gave slaves the option to buy freedom from their Muslim owners. After the Arab Spring and the collapse of civil society in Libya, it emerged that by 2018, slave trafficking had soared in the Mediterranean ports of Libya, which under the Ottomans 
had exported sub-Saharan labor to Europe. Both the Quran and Hadith contain dozens of texts which call for slaves to be freed. The reality is that Islam changed the way in which slavery was dealt and invented many other ways of liberating slaves. Conveniently, this is something that critics of the Prophet Muhammad through the centuries to the present day choose to ignore, as do the Islamic extremists who suffer either from religious illiteracy or deliberately choose to misquote and skew hadith and the context of the Quran in order to validate their outrageous violence. While there are plenty of verses condemning the practice of slavery, there's not one single verse suggesting that it should continue. Another subject which is often highlighted by our detractors, although rarely understood, is the tradition of shunning the drawings of senior religious personalities and prophets, as well as Allah. To paint, sculpt, or create any images, for instance, depicting the Prophet Muhammad would be considered blasphemous by most Muslims. But we rarely explain to non-Muslims why. As a result, humans and animals are absent from the vast majority of visual Islamic art and architecture, and the strictest adherence to this rule can be evidenced inside mosques, masjids, and Islamic prayer rooms where Muslims gather to worship. Sunni Muslims, for instance, decisively rejected images of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, well before the 18th century emergence of Wahhabism, reflecting a very real fear that Islam's final messenger was slowly being turned into some sort of demigod. Muhammad, peace be upon him, wanted Muslims to focus more on the content of the Quran and Hadith rather than fall into the trap of iconizing and worshipping him. And uh, he was the first to admit, I am nothing more than a human being. There are many references in the Quran and Hadith to remind followers that he could not perform miracles uh, or was anything other than a, an ordinary man. He wanted uh, to prevent anyone giving him cult-like veneration um, that had previously given to idols. This sort of treatment is exactly the opposite of how he wanted to be remembered by others, which could further explain why he was so against any depiction of him in art or sculpture. Clearly fearful of being turned into some sort of deity uh, through the centuries, his anxieties are expressed in several hadith. While there's nothing specific in the Quran which prohibits portraits of the Prophet Muhammad, it does discourage, like the Hebrew Bible's Ten Commandments, the worshipping of any graven images. One of the most significant prophets to all three Abrahamic faiths is the prophet Abraham, who was universally known for his hatred of false gods and idol worship. The Quran makes clear to all Muslims that the worshipping of idols is strictly forbidden. In one example, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, the angels do not enter a house in which there is an image. Further explanations of his companions reveal that he was referring to the images of creatures that have souls. It is something Muslim artists down the centuries have grappled with as they set about creating works of arts while avoiding using the images of humans or animals. Artists who have drawn or painted the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, do so with his face veiled or symbolically represent him as a flame or incorporate other subliminal images to hide any facial features or expressions. While he has been painted on a few rare occasions, depictions of the founder of Islam barely exist today outside of museum archives. So to get back to the so-called cartoon crisis, which erupted in 2005 when a Danish newspaper published more than a dozen crude uh, images, the majority of which portrayed the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in a critical light. There was outrage. The newspaper defended it, um, 
saying that uh, it was merely open up the debate about free uh, speech and the right to criticize Islam, as well as question the apparent self-censorship imposed by Muslims after um, a Danish writer complained he was unable to find an illustrator for a children's book about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because he said no one dared draw his image. As a response, the newspaper invited cartoons to draw him as they saw him. The gesture designed to promote free speech and reject what the media saw as unreasonable pressure by Muslim groups to respect their sensitivities ignited global outrage uh, from Muslims. Far from achieving an enlightened debate, the publication of the cartoons unleashed street demonstrations and riots in a number of Muslim countries, which resulted in more than 200 deaths, as well as attacks on Danish and other European diplomatic missions, attacks on churches and Christians and a major international boycott. Uh, the Jilin Post and uh, Commission was viewed by many as an invitation to be deliberately provocative towards Muslims, and this was borne out by some of the content of the images. One portrayed um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, carrying a fuse lit bomb in the shape of a turban on his head, decorated with the Islamic creed, which was drawn by um, a Danish cartoonist. There is little doubt that collectively the publication of the cartoons was designed to provoke the Muslim community. And one writer, Zayedun Sadar, drew parallels with the anti Semitic images published in Europe in the 1920s and 30s, aimed at the Jewish community. Rabbis were depicted with ringlets with grenades in their uh, ringlets. So it caused a huge furore at the time and uh, a delegation uh, tried to raise the issue uh, with the government in Denmark, but they refused to intervene um, and in any official capacity. Within the first two months of 2006, the media coverage intensified to such a degree that we had global protests um, especially from those hostile to Islam who said this was an attack on free speech. The cartoons were then reprinted in France, Germany, Holland, Switzerland, Spain and Italy. Saudi Arabia withdrew its ambassador to Copenhagen while Syria recalled its chief diplomat and Libya closed its em embassy. Armed Palestinian men from the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade briefly occupied the EU's office in the Gaza Strip, demanding an apology from Denmark. There were many other uh, such incidents. And um, then there was the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo, which published new cartoons of uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. In addition to the 12, it uh, also published from the Danish newspaper. Subsequent legal actions failed and the magazine returned to the subject again, stoking more controversy in 2011, which resulted in its officers being firebombed. Four people, including Ambassador Chris Stevens, um, US Ambassador Chris Stevens, were killed in Libya. Um, a controversial film attacking Islam was then broadcast. The United Nations heard a speech from President uh, Barack Obama asking those um, who uh, had hurt uh, Islam to stop. He said the future must not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. But to be credible, he said, those who condemn that slander must also condemn the hate we see in the images of Jesus Christ that are desecrated or churches that are destroyed or the Holocaust that is denied. Internationally respected journalist Mehdi Hassan uh, wrote an open letter to the Muslim world urging restraint and his words were my islamic faith is based on the principles of peace moderation and mercy it revolves around the quranic verses there is no compulsion in religion 
and unto you your religion and unto me my religion. Normally a staunch defender of the Muslim world, he was critical of the response and accused Muslims of losing self-control. He asked WWMD, what would the Prophet Muhammad uh, endorse? And uh, of course, we know, we know in our hearts, he would not endorse violent attacks on foreign embassies, schools, on police stations and shops. Um, as a child, he was taught about Muhammad, um, how he was verbally and physically abused by the pagan worshippers of Mecca, but never responded in kind. The Quran calls him a mercy of all creation. Continuing on the same vein, um, Mehdi Hassan said, you say you love the prophet, and yet uh, you... Um, and yet in Saudi Arabia, the house of the prophet's first wife, Khadija, was flattened to make way for a public toilet, while the house where Muhammad was born is now overshadowed by a royal palace. He asked, you know, where was the outrage of ordinary Muslims then? If his words were meant to ease tensions, they failed as Charlie Hebdo once again uh, stoked the flames of hate by publishing more cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad with some images showing him naked. Um, the publication in the same month came a few days after a series of attacks on the American embassies in the Middle East and North Africa, said to be in response uh, to an awful film called The Innocence of Muslims. However, a more violent and shocking event unfolded in January 2015 when two Algerian brothers burst into Charlie Hebdo's magazine, killing 12 people. And, and six months later in uh, the July, the editor announced there would be no further cartoons or drawings of the Prophet Muhammad. It is increasingly clear that our beloved prophet, um, peace be upon him, was concerned about drawings and it didn't have anything to do with freedom of speech or expression um, and everything to do with how Islam's followers worshipped God. Um, Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a humble man. He did not want anyone to turn him into a deity. He obviously um, feared that uh, images of him might create a pathway down the centuries to idolatry. As the debate continues, one thing is clear, excessive veneration of Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not acceptable in Islam, just as violence as a way of showing devotion to him is also forbidden. He himself warned against all kinds of exaggerated behavior and is reported to have said, do not exaggerate about me, as was exaggerated about Isa, uh, Jesus. Uh, so, which brings us back to the facts and falsehoods again. Life is very unreal at the moment. It's hard to believe our eyes as we watch the news or look out of our windows at home. Nothing has prepared us for the world of COVID-19, not even the most lurid Hollywood movies portraying dystopian nightmarish scenes of empty streets and enforced isolation in post-apocalyptic surroundings. Even binge-watching the 10 seasons of The Walking Dead cannot prepare us for the days ahead. As human beings, we are not built to live in isolation, and as Muslims, we are moving towards Ramadan not really knowing what to expect. For all 1.9 billion of us around the world, this will be a Ramadan like no other. How do we prepare for it? I would humbly suggest we follow the example of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, a man for all seasons, a man who faced the um, trials thrown at him with dignity, calm and grace. So please, um, in times of turmoil, ask yourself, what would the Prophet Muhammad do?
anyway, that is the uh, the end of my talk. But I gather that uh, questions um, will also be asked. So um, please fire away. I hope you've enjoyed listening to it. Um, I don't know if I rattled on a bit uh, too much, but I see that there's a, a question. Um, what attracted you to Islam and what are some of the challenges you faced after becoming a Muslim? And that's from Savan bin Ershad. Um, what attracted me to Islam was the concept of equality. The Holy Quran makes it crystal clear that we women are equal in spirituality, worth and education. But also this theme of justice, which goes through every page, uh, was also fascinating for me. It, it's um, very easy to treat your family and friends kindly and with justice, but to deliver the same justice to your enemies now, that is uh, something different. And uh, Islam was insisting that we treat everyone, regardless of our views of them, equally. So that um, really uh, took me down the, the, the road of Islam. Being captured by the Taliban, it was a traumatic experience, but it triggered my interest in Islam because watching them, uh, for 11 days, I had nothing else to do, locked up in Afghanistan. Uh, but watching them, it became quite clear to me that Islam is a way of life. It's more than just a religion we uh, adhere to on a Friday by, well, at one time going into the mosques. But uh, it, it, it became clear to me that Islam is a way of life. And the next question from Sahib Iqbal, why did the non-Muslims um, become so scared from Islam, um, although this is the religion of peace? Well, you know, uh, as I said before, um, people of other faith, especially the Christians, saw the dramatic rise of, of Islam. It was unprecedented and they were fearful that they would um, lose their own faith. And, you know, imagine how we react when we think Islam is under threat. You know, we will do anything to defend um, our faith and the reputation of the Prophet Muhammad. And Christians and people of other faiths obviously feel the same way. And so, um, you know, this is why there, there was, and still is today, from the Christian far right, uh, the evangelicals, there's so much hostility towards um, Islam. So, you know, we should remember as Muslims, we are ambassadors to our faith. So if we go along the street and throw litter on the ground or kick a cat or a dog or curse at somebody or spit on the pavement. Um, we're being judged as Muslims, as, as the front line of our faith. So really, um, if we are the best of examples, then that in itself is great dower work and a, a great advert for Islam. And perhaps we should Think about that um, when we are being tested and provoked. Any more questions? The, the thing to remember is that um, I am not a scholar of Islam. Um, I am on a continual journey. I am learning. 
it is important to verify what I say, research what I say, corroborate. Um, if I'm wrong, contact me and let me know. Uh, but uh, everything that I've quoted, I have done in uh, in good faith. Um, but it's uh, it you know, Allah gave us all a brain, and we should use it.